Now, you need to understand what's happening in the Earth that gives us the oil and gas. So we're going to start with a layer or two of source rock out here. This is commonly a black <coughs> layer. It was deposited in an ocean bottom setting or a lake bottom setting that had no oxygen. So any organic matter that got to the seafloor got preserved. And much of, in fact, most of the oil and gas in the world started out as plants. Okay, algae in the ocean, land plants, anything that photosynthesizes. Because what we're dealing with in oil and natural gas is essentially fossil sunlight. Okay, it got used by photosynthetic plants and turned into organic compounds and somehow preserved at the bottom. <coughs> then we need reservoir rocks like sandstones or limestones. And we need a link between those two, so if oil and gas is generated here by the heat of the earth, it can migrate into our reservoir. We need a trap, meaning some kind of a structure. The most common is just a rollover like that that seals in several directions. And because there's water in the pores in the rock, and oil and gas float on water, the oil and gas migrate to the top of the structure, and they'd sit there if there is a trap, and if there is a seal on top. So the gas is usually on the top because it floats more than oil. Then the layer of oil, and then all this will be filled with water. And it's just sitting there waiting for somebody to discover it. But when we're talking about risk, we're talking about the probability, and this is all to do with probabilities, that those elements are not only there, but they're effective. Has the source rock been heated enough? Is the migration path effective? Is the reservoir porous enough? Is it permeable, meaning can it pass the fluids through it? Is the trap and the seal competent to hold it there? If you get enough buoyancy of a, a big thousand foot thick column, it's going to try and break through the seal on top. So all of those things have to be affected. Then we come to the money part. Economics play a big role in what we do. We talk about leads when we have an idea and prospects when they're drillable. We work through all the data, we're ready to drill. We make a reserves forecast, and does anybody know the difference between a resource in the ground and reserves? When you hear that number being thrown around, a lot of people get sloppy with it. So be real careful. If you ever hear somebody talking about the oil reserves in Saudi Arabia, the oil reserves in India, that reserves has a very specific definition. And that is oil or gas that we can get out of the ground at today's cost. So if the price of oil goes to $300 a barrel, the reserves in the world will increase. It's not magic. It's just that it's tied to the ability to get it out economically. And then what kind of a well? We can go down, straight down. We can go down a mile and turn out this way and drill two miles. We can go with a big S shape. We can have a single well with multiple completion zones in it. There are all kinds of options that make sense economically, depending on the kinds of rocks you're dealing with. And then, of course, our engineering friends have to design the surface facilities. There are pipelines and gathering systems, and ultimately taking that to market and selling it. Or if you're a fully integrated company, that means you have your own pipelines and your own refineries and your own marketing system. And it can be done entirely within one company. Price forecast change. I don't know anybody that can do a decent price forecast for oil and gas. It has never happened, but we always get taken by surprise. But it does change with the seasons, particularly in a place like Boston, where you're going to use more oil and gas in the winter because you have more heating demands. And then taxes, well, we know they tend to change a lot. The regime in Washington or in other countries really dictates how profitable you're going to be. And then in many countries, there's something called the state direct financial interest. And that is that in most countries, the oil belongs to the people, to the nation. And they may take a working interest, meaning the government actually buys into the cost of drilling the wells, or they may take a more of a taxation or royalty interest, meaning they just take the money off that you generate. And this gets into who owns the oil. Uh, in this country, Private people can own the oil, or private companies, but that's not true in every part of the world. Now here's another guessing game for you. If I'm in a multinational oil company, like the one I work for, how much of the world's oil do you think is accessible to my company if we want to go and buy a lease to drill? Only 7% of the oil in the world 
and 93% is owned by state oil companies in places like Kuwait and Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Norway. Now we can go and be friends with those companies, and we do try to, that, try to do that a lot, but that puts us politically in the situation of dealing with some country's national oil company when they're not really favored by the U.S. We've learned how to become more multinational, and our own State Department has had to learn that some of these contacts are valuable with countries that otherwise we would not be much interested in. In this country, surface rights and mineral rights are severed. They're not the same thing. So if I go out to drill a well in Texas, there might be a rancher there, but he doesn't own the oil under his land. Somebody else does because the original owner sold the mineral rights to somebody. So we go out and buy the mineral rights. We can drill a well there, and we have to pay any damages if we knock his fence over or you know, his apple tree or they claim we made the bull sterile or something like that. <coughs> but um, they cannot prevent us. These surface rights people cannot prevent us from going out and drilling our well. And then these terms, we go for, in many countries, for an oil drilling license, or in some countries for an oil mining license. Is anyone here from Nigeria? They have oil mining licenses in Nigeria. There are leases, and there are royalty owners, and a royalty is simply a payment you make for the right to be there. And it's usually to the person who started out owning mineral rights, or it's to the government that owned the mineral rights. And then usually we have partners in with us because this is such a risky endeavor. So we go out and we buy a lease in some odd part of the world. And we say it's very high risk. We want to find some people to share that risk. So we'll go approach another company or three other companies. Sometimes in various parts of the world, the foreign government will tell us who our partners will be. And that's quite interesting because a moment ago you were fierce competitors and today you're best friends. It's an odd situation. This is the scariest thing I can show you. This is the remaining reserves, remember that, that term, recoverable at today's cost, in various parts of the world. And I would like you to look for countries that you consider politically stable. Or let's turn it around. Where are the ones you consider politically unstable? Or friendly to the US. Or friendly to the US. Yeah, this is a big, big issue. And here's the US way down here. Canada, some other people that we consider our best buddies. And this is why a simple disruption in the supply chain can wreak such havoc to the world economy. Yes? The, the remaining oil, is that as you qualified before, at today's prices? At today's prices. Right. And you, you don't include uh, shell oil, scent oil? No. This is liquid uh, oil, excluding things like the heavy sands. Heavy oil sands. How many, how many years does that add up to in current, in current consumption? Uh, I would guess about 40. That's just a real rough guess. Okay, we still haven't drilled our well yet. So now the question is, what are we going to do with our money? And an oil company doesn't have infinite funds. So we've got competing projects. We need to know what's best for not only our shareholders, but for the owners if they are, say, the government of Norway government of Qatar. Management may have lots of options. They may not want to drill my well. They may think it's too risky. They may want to go find a partner and share the risk. Or if we think it's a great deal and our partner doesn't, we may try to buy it then out. So they will take greater risk. Now we've got to go.